Uh, welcome to the class. Uh, I'm Bob Aldea. I've been a member of the club since before we called it a club. Um, did this class originally back in 2003, I believe, as part of a team. In those days, the club did every presentation as a team. That way you had a senior person and a junior person, or perhaps two junior people struggling through a presentation. Uh, but you always had backup that way. If somebody couldn't make it, somebody else could pick up the load and carry through. So, it hasn't been updated a whole lot since then, so we're still working with antique routers and we won't get into brand specific recommendations, even if I do mention some. What we're going to cover today is a little bit about what a router is, how you might want to use it, how you should use it safely, and some of the cuter jigs that you can use to get jobs done. How many people in the group don't have a router or have never used a router? So I'm preaching to the choir. How many don't even have a router table? <laughs> All good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, this is intro to routers, so you're going to have to bear with us. Um, basically, a router is nothing more than a motor and a collet chuck to hold the bit. This is a trim router. It's about as simple as it gets. It does have a movable base on it, and it has a chuck. Now, the collets on these come in two different styles. Either there's a push button that locks the collet in place, the shaft in place, and you can use one wrench, or as was common in some of the older porta cables, you need two wrenches because there's actually two nuts, or there's a nut and a shaft with no lock. Um, this is my toy router. I picked this up at Harbor Freight for 20 bucks just to see what you could get for 20 bucks. And you get a surprising amount. I wouldn't say it's high quality, but you do get a surprising amount of stuff with it. I own three of them. <laughs> say what? I own three of them. <laughs> well, this one hasn't broken, but uh, That's exactly right. I don't use it a whole lot either. Okay. Motor and a collet chuck to hold the bits. Uh, they come in different sizes, obviously. I've got them from a three horse down to fractional horse trim routers. Uh, <clears throat> depends upon the size of the bit that you're using, what kind of power you need. I know DeWalt is now pushing their new mini router because uh, it's uh, Similar to the old ones, but now it has variable speed and the plunge and fixed bases, which is nothing really new. It's just a little bit smaller and lighter, um, which can be a big plus. If you are doing something like routing a hole in a wall to put an electrical box in, which I did, this is not the ideal <coughs> router to do it with. But it's the one I used because it was the only one I had at the time that was suitable because it had a plunge base. So that's the other difference. In addition to variations in horsepower, this is an antique one horsepower Craftsman router my dad gave me back in 1971. Um, it only has quarter inch collet, will not take any larger bits. The two sizes that are common in this country are quarter and half inch shaft on the bits. There exist three eighth inch bits, but it's uncommon for you to see a collet or the bits other, unless you get into metalworking end mills or something. Um, Lee's pushing that, I think. Aye. And they're smaller dust, but you get away from the quarter shaft. Well, quarters, a little light. Half is kind of bulky, too bulky for some bits. Um, this particular router uses what's called a rack and pinion. There's little teeth, and then there's a knob with a vernier adjustment to control the height of the motor in the base, which effectively controls how much the bit projects. It's a very workable scheme. Um, some routers, instead of using a rack and pinion, they will actually have threads on the motor housing so that you twist the motor in the base to extend it 
or retract it. But also works well. The old Porta Cable 690 was probably the industrial standard for contractors for many years and that's how it worked. It had all the disadvantages you could imagine, but everybody owned at least one, if not many. Because they were virtually indestructible, they were easy to use, the only power switch was on the motor, so you had to take your hand off the handles to turn it on and off. Um, it did have only quart, no, it had half inch shanks, it would do that, and it had a big base. Um, but it did screw into its base, single speed, no variable speed. Um, so it was unsophisticated, but it was durable, and they're still around. You can still get them. Um, so, why would you have a plunge base? Two of these are plunge base routers. Basically, it allows the motor to slide up and down, and then you can lock it in place. This one uses a handle by twisting it. Some of the others will have a lever that you operate with your thumb to lock the plunge. Matter of fact, some of them lock when you press the lever. Some of them unlock when you press the lever so that they lock routinely anytime you're not touching them. Uh, <coughs> plunge routers are really convenient for stopped cuts where you're making a groove that doesn't go from one end of the piece to the other, but needs to stop and just go for a, a short section. In which case, you can plunge, move the router, and then stop and release, and the router will retract the bit. Um, I mentioned location of the switches. Most of these are very convenient. They have the handle switch. This one's a little, a little less convenient than most. This old antique Craftsman has a trigger switch, very handy. Um, this is a little bit less intuitive, but there is a switch that slides up and down when it's not clogged with sawdust. So you can operate that without taking your hands off the handles, and that's safer. Uh, this router normally lives upside down in my router table, which is actually in the extension for my table saw. I have a rather compact shop, so table saw is here, router table is here. Um, this router is mounted with a plate. This is pretty common these days. Uh, you can get these plates in aluminum, phenolic, acrylic, a variety of different types as you get into the bigger routers. Thicker, stronger is better. I have an aluminum plate that I haven't installed yet. Um, this one is smaller than it should be for this router, but that helps reduce sagging. Okay, so we have these routers. They hold bits, they have plunge bases, they have fixed bases. What are you going to do with these things? Well, you're going to mount a bit and you're going to cut. The bits that you can get defy description. If this is like razors. You buy, they give you the razor and then they sell you all the blades. You can spend a fortune on router bits because high-end bits start at 25, 30 bucks a piece. Low-end bits might be $5. Generally, I recommend half-inch shanks because they're stronger, they vibrate less, but I still have my old collection of quarter-inch shanks, and I still use them for some bits. There is a bearing guided bit in this router that is only available in a quarter-inch shank, and let me describe that a little bit rather than try and zoom in. This router bit has a cutter. There's a cutter out on each side. Then there is a bearing on the shank. And the shank comes down into the collet of the router. Essentially what this allows you to do is ride this bearing on a template or on any surface. And the cutter will cut 
to the same shape as the bearing is following. This particular bit that I'm using in here is a mortising bit. Um, you can get other bearing guided bits. Um, this is called a pattern bit. Uh, has the bearing at the top of the shank. Similarly, you can have shaping bits which cut one contour or another. You can also get bottom bearing pattern bits. This is very similar to the mortising bit I just described, but it's in fact a great deal larger and in, because it's larger it can have a half inch shank. Now, they like to say in the turning group that there's only three cuts you're going to make. You're going to make coves, beads, and straight cuts. That's all there is to turning and using a lathe. Well, when you're working with a router, it really is too. You're going to make coves of one kind or another. You're going to make beads or you're going to cut something relatively straight. It's basically the only type. You can get into fancier cutters which have a combination of those contours. Well, let me turn this sideways so you can see it a little better. And the c combination just approximates multiple bits. Matter of fact, you can make complex cuts by using multiple bits. If you had nothing more than some uh, core box or round nose bits combined with a uh, round over, you can accomplish a variety of different curves. Now, once you have bits that can cut the wood, you have to guide them through the wood in some way, shape, or form. You notice all of the bits that I brought out so far have bearings on them. Um, well, all but one. And those bearings can be used to guide the bit. They don't have to be, but they can be. There are also bits, plain bits, either straight or round nose that don't have a bearing and you have to provide some other guidance for the router so that it doesn't wander and do things you don't want. Okay, um, I mentioned there are quarter inch shanks. There are times when you really need it and it's useful. Uh, generally, I try to stick with a half inch shank and that's what I would recommend. Hardly any of the modern routers are limited to quarter inch shanks except the real small trim routers and that new DeWalt one that I think I mentioned. Now how are we going to guide a bit? Well, one system that was developed, I guess by Porter Cable, since they use Porter Cable's name every time they refer to these, is guide bushings. And these guide bushings will fit into the base of a router and allow you to guide the bit. For instance, on this router, there's a recess. This guide bushing fits here. Once the router bit has been installed, you now have a bearing surface and then the router bit can make the cut. So that is one way to guide the bit. You can get these in a brass, which theoretically are safer. Um, my only problem with some of these is that the bushing is actually taller than I like because that means you need a real thick template. So I have one here that I've already cut down specifically so that I can use quarter inch thick templates. Now there's a collar that goes on the underside of that base plate to hold this bushing in place so that it doesn't wander. So how would we use that? 
I've got an example down in here. Um, Thank you, pardon? You ever have any trouble with that nut vibrating loose? Yeah, it can. In which case you need to snug it up. So it's worth checking. If you can twist the nose of it, it's probably loose. This is a template. The purpose of the template is to do things like arch top doors. Because you can make this template, cut it out with whatever tool you have handy, smooth it down with files, sandpaper, whatever you like, and then with some double stick tape, you can apply this to the piece of wood that you're getting ready to route. That would allow you, with one of these bearing bushings, or preferably a bearing guided bit, to do a complete contour, which is what I did on the end of this piece, or in fact, with a shaping bit such as one of these in a door making set, cut the contour and the groove for the uh, raised panel. All by following this template, which is double stick onto your workpiece. Generally, you're going to do this on a router table. It's perfectly feasible to do it handheld, and sometimes you do. I don't have them with me, but I had some uh, roundover bit or templates that I created specifically for making round corners on tabletops and things like that. And it was nothing more than a piece of uh, masonite. Uh, material like this with the corner cut round. Double stick tape that to your corner of your workpiece and you can use the router to cut that right off. Now you can do more than just clean up an edge. You can genuinely cut with the larger horsepowers and the bigger bits. I can go through a three quarter inch piece of wood no problem. It's like a table saw. There's no arguing with three horsepower. <laughs> it wins. Um, <laughs> That's true. It's not true horsepower. You can't get three horsepower out of a 115 volt outlet. However, the amperage drain on this router is significantly higher than any of the others, and it does have significantly more power. Um, while we're on the subject of bits, this is something you will see occasionally. It's a, a uh, door making set. It includes a bit specifically for raising panels. And I think I have a couple of pieces. Ah. There we go. This test piece has every cut you would make in making a raised panel door. At one end, it has the actual raised panel relieved in the back, narrowed down to a quarter inch to fit into a slot in the panel. There is a cutter that cuts the end of each rail, and then there's the other cutter that makes the surface on the rails and the styles. So those three bits are what are used to make this piece. Um, then we have drawer joint bit and a glue joint bit. Now normally, a raised panel bit like this, being as large it is, as it is, is going to be used in a stronger two to three horsepower router. It requires a large opening in the base. So if your base is small, you're not going to be able to fit this in there. You also need variable speed because you can't run this at 25,000 RPM. That's just too much for a bit this size. You're going to do this in a router table. This is grabbing enough wood to where if you were doing it handheld, it could easily get out of, out of control. 
So that's one method whereby this would be sitting in a router table and your workpiece would be passed over the table over that bit, generally using the bearing as well as a fence to make that cut. There's another way, which is a little bit less common, but if you're working with a lower horsepower router and you're determined you're going to make raised panels, this is called a vertical panel razor. It has a contour on it, but it requires a tall vertical fence so that you can run the piece past the bit. But it's very workable. So if you have a one horsepower router, there's no reason you can't do raised panels. No well, on the previous example where you had the door horizontal, mm -hmm. you're using that large raised panel door bit. Mm -hmm. What's actually guiding that? The bearing or the fence? Um, generally, I align the bearing with the fence. <coughs> Since we've moved on to that, let me bring out the fence and we'll talk a little bit about that. This is my fence. It's not my own design. I copied it from, I guess it's, is it CMT? Yes. Um, it's a fairly elegant design in my impression, or my opinion. Um, and being frugal, I made it myself rather than give them their two or three hundred dollars for it. The fence sits on the router table. It has a pivot point, which is nothing more than a quarter inch hole through the base plate and into the surface of my table saw extension. It also has a slot. That allows me to run another knob with a quarter twenty thread down into an insert that I've placed in the surface of this extension. So now this piece can pivot in and out of the bit. And I have one lockdown knob to concern myself with. So if you're lazy, that's easy. It also has zero clearance inserts. The reason you want a zero clearance insert is to minimize tear out when you're doing a cut. Now I had that large raised panel bit and this particular insert here allows me to make a cut with very little space around it. Now normally with a non-bearing bit to make this insert, I would just crank up the router with the bit extended and then just pivot the fence into the bit. You can't do that when there's bearings sticking up. They don't cut. So what you have to do is make the cut first with a half inch or a nine sixteenths bit to allow clearance for the bearing. Then the bit will cut the uh, opening as necessary. And these replaceable inserts are a piece of cake to make. The fence actually slides so I can lock this down so that this insert won't go anywhere. A couple of wing nuts on the back. Lock it in place. It provides dust collection. As I said, it's a fairly elegant design. It's easy to make. There's no need to go out and spend a fortune to, make, to buy one. Um, <clears throat> there's another operation that I don't recommend, but you can do and you'll hear about it, and that is jointing on a router. So if you take a straight bit like this, mount it in the router, and then double stick tape a piece of laminate on the outfeed side of your fence, you effectively have replicated a mini jointer with a one or two inch cut. And you can do that. So you can joint fairly short pieces. I think the rule of thumb is you can joint something about twice the length of your bed of your jointer. So that's probably where you're at with one of these. It's not going to be fast because you don't have the power of a jointer. Uh, and of course you can't make large surface cuts. But it's doable if you're desperate. Your 
quality of your joy depend on the quality of your fence? Um, to some degree, the fence needs to be square. It needs to be smooth. That one's unfinished MDF. It's been on that router table since, I don't know, 98, 99. Why don't you keep it dry? Pardon? Why don't you keep it dry? Yeah, yeah. Well, it doesn't rain in my basement too often. But... <laughs> And I try not to spray water from the sink, but... Um, I actually use a straight bit to joint the edge of that nine foot board, but I had to use a straight edge to run the router along there. So you s used a straight edge and a bearing guided bit? bit or run along the edge and okay. the board. All right, we've mentioned uh, bearing guided bits. Let me mention another option. Um, a lot of different Routers will come with some sort of a guide fence. Even this little $20 piece of junk has one. And essentially, this fence mounts to the bottom of the router so that when you're doing handheld work, such as trimming the edge of a countertop, this will work and it will guide the router. If you have to do curved surfaces, this won't work. So what they offer you is a bearing which also mounts to the side of the router and you position this bearing so that the surface of the bearing lines up with the surface of your cutter. Now it will follow a curved surface and do it well without a bearing on the bit. So this is for guiding a non-bearing bit which are a whole lot cheaper than bearing guided bits. Okay, so what are we doing with this router? We've actually mentioned a whole lot of the things we're doing. We're edge forming, making contours. Uh, this is really a table edge bit. Its purpose is to make decorative edges on tables, cabinets, whatever. Um, you might be making rabbits on the end of a piece. And although you can do that with a straight bit, a better way to do it is with a rabbiting bit, which I have here somewhere, I believe. Of course, you have to be able to get the box open. Okay, this is a rabbiting bit. It has a cutter. It's not intended for making real deep cuts and it has a bearing at the top. Actually, it has a whole collection of bearings so that you can change the bearing size and that effectively changes the depth of the cut. What will happen is your bearing I assume these are all dry, right? Yeah. The bearing will be riding on the surface of the workpiece, and the cutter being above that with the shaft will actually cut the rabbit. So if I make a smaller bearing, the cutter will proceed deeper and make a wider rabbit. So they can be real handy as long as you're willing to take the time to change the bits or the bearings. Okay, how about, <coughs> if I might mention, I've got one of those less expensive round table with a, a MDF top. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes, and it has a half inch on mm it. -hmm. Sometimes I have problems extending the pallet out, raising it up enough. To make a good cut. Ah, uh, yep. And so uh, I bought an extension. But I think maybe it might have been with the OG cut or the quarter round or half round cut, the wider. When I put that sucker in and turn it on, 
the vibration? A lot more vibration because I, I guess, you know, if anything is the least bit off. That's it. The, the further away from the center of movement, the, the, the more vibration it is. So be alert to that. Yeah, the problem with extenders is they have to be machined perfectly so that the bit isn't off center and off balance. The bit itself has to be a good quality bit so that it's properly balanced. There's no doubt about it. If you're extending that bit, you're adding stress, so I would recommend you slow it down. I don't know. That might have been, that might have been what I did. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't have my, my control hooked up yet. I was having a hard time really finding a delay fuse for my, my control, but uh, uh, I didn't have a veritable speed. I have a add-on plug you know, mm -hmm. to control the speed. That might have been part of it, but it might have also been the extender was not perfectly true. The the bearing, I mean, even a hair's breadth wobble on a mount to a hill of bean at 2,000 RPM, mm -hmm. but slinging it at 25,000, a hair different is going to really shake the house. Okay. While we're on the subject of extending bits, you will see that there are dramatic differences in the length of the shaft on bits that you will find in the marketplace. I did a field test of a bunch of Porta Cable bits when they first brought them out, and they were universally short, just barely long enough. What you have to remember is that the collet itself is only so deep. So beyond the collet, there's no advantage. So you really need about one inch inserted. Beyond, how do you tell how far is one inch when you have a long shaft? Well, you might want to mark it. You might want to pay close attention. But as long as you get about one inch of that shank down in there, you're getting as good a grip off that collet as you can. Now, if the bit is out of balance, same story as with an extender. The farther out it is, the more you're going to feel vibrations. You will sometimes hear people say, oh, you just drop the bit all the way in. Well, don't drop the bit all the way in. I don't know if you can see this on the camera. There is a rounded edge on that bit bit is shaped like this. The shaft comes down like so. But there's actually a slightly rounded piece where it was machined. If you drop the collet all the way in to where it's actually on that slope and tighten it, a little bit of vibration and the bit moves up and now it's loose. So you definitely want to stay away from that little uh, rounded section. The Porter Cable bits, in their wisdom, said, oh, we'll solve that problem. And they came out and they put a, a sharp step in it, thinking, oh yeah, that'll fix it. And that'll allow precision positioning of the bits. The problem is, is that when you have one of these collets, it has a nut. And that nut typically sticks up beyond the collet. So now when you drop the bit in there and you start tightening the nut, the bit doesn't necessarily drop down, so it's no longer resting right on the collet, so precision's out the window. You do get a good grip, but to think that, oh yeah, that's precisely the same height every time whenever I put it in and I don't have to measure, not true. Um, CMT I forget the guy's name, gives a demo on door making with their sets. Summerfield. Mark Summerfield. And one of the things he does is he takes a little space ball, drops it down in the router, and he drops his router bits down into that collet. It hits on the space ball, he tightens the collet, and he says, this bit will always be in the right position, and I'll change bits, and they'll all line up. It seems to work for him. I don't have a whole lot of faith in that concept, but he gives demos in and his pieces fit together. 
So if you want to buy CMT quality bits and pay their prices, that may work for you. If you're frugal and you're getting your bits from China or wherever, I wouldn't recommend it. Well, I'll, I'll get a few comments on, <coughs> on placing those bits. One is uh, you should never uh, allow the shaft to bottom out. That's true. Uh, because the collet is actually, from an engineering standpoint, designed to have a certain amount of slip in order for it to work. And if you bottom the shaft out, when you go to tighten that collet, uh, it, it cannot grip completely on the shaft. So that's sort of a dangerous situation. Uh, you should, the, the recommendation is to, to bottom it and then back it out like about a millimeter and then tighten it. And that way the collet can actually function the way it's supposed, it's designed to function. The other thing is uh, if, you, if you bottom it out, uh, there's a pretty good chance that you're going to lock down on that bit and not be able to get that bit back out. If you ever had one stick, uh, in a router before, it's you pain. know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, if you always back it out slightly before you tighten it down, you won't have that problem. And what some people do, instead of using a space ball, uh, they'll get a little O-ring that fits mm -hmm. the hole, and they'll drop an O-ring in there and just leave it in there. Mm -hmm. That gives you just enough flex to keep it off. Yeah, as he mentioned, sometimes they'll stick. You loosen the collet and you feel like everything should be free and that bit doesn't want to move. Well, if you've allowed some clearance, like he says, you can just give it a little tap with a block of wood and the bit can move down and that loosens it and now it'll come right out. What about a rubber <coughs> small O-ring? That's what he just suggested. Oh, yeah. but that's what he was told. Yeah, yeah. I didn't get it. Is it uh, the wall has the self-ejecting feature that the OE is in? Both of the DeWalt's do. That's a unique feature of the collet um, in some manufacturers. When you're loosening the nut on the collet, the collet stays tight. And the reason is, is because the collet is fitting into a shaft that is slightly tapered. And once it jams down in there, it doesn't want to go anywhere. Well, what they did is they put, I believe it's a lip on the collet itself. Can't remember whether it's a, a is it a groove? Because the nut actually has an engaging groove or ring or whatever, so that it, when you loosen the nut, it spins free, and then if you continue to turn it, it actually impacts resistance because it's now trying to push the collet free. And you'll need a wrench to get it the rest of the way. And then it'll actually push the collet out. So both of these use that. Uh, none of my others do. There's another solution to that depth of cut question, too. You mean ex for extension? Well, to solve that problem, get a shaper. <laughs> or you can get a router that is designed to extend further. Some do. Um, most of these, the collet and nut will come mm, almost even with the base of the router. There are a couple of brands where that motor will actually come up and expose the nut and the collet, which means you can cut deeper. It also means you can easily get a wrench on it from the top instead of having to reach under your base plate or through the opening or however you're doing that. But you can't your collars interfere to pull the cable style collar. Oh yeah, you can't use it with that. Yeah. You can only extend so far when you have one of those in place. Yeah, Ron. Why are we not losing why are you not losing usable length and the thickness of the table? Is it because the plates are always whatever they are quarter inch? What happens is you have a base plate on any router and they vary in thickness. This one isn't much more than a sixteenth of an inch of phenolic. Uh, this old Craftsman's probably three sixteenths of an inch. 
the one that originally, well, it's actually, it's still on there. The one on this big dewalt is maybe an eighth of an inch thick, you but now we're adding. And you, added, you, you added another one on top of it. And now I'm adding a drop-in plate. This one happens to be about five sixteenths of an inch thick. The acrylics tend to be three eighths. Even a lot of the phenolics. This is a phenolic here. It's about three eighths of an inch. So you've lost that much cut. If you're making a homebrew router table, which I strongly recommend, and you're going to use an old sink cutout or whatever, you really don't want to use it at a full three-quarter thick where the router mounts. What you want to do is, using your router or whatever, uh, provide a recess so that this is maybe five sixteenths. You don't need that much strength because this isn't going to support the weight over 12 inches. It's only an in half an inch three-quarters of an inch from the edge. So that's thick enough. And then the router will sit down in here and you will lose only three-eighths of an inch or so in your bit penetration. The other thing on what you're saying, I have, a, I have one of those DeWalt's with the three different heads, three different bases, and you mm -hmm. take the motor out and then I've just got a lift and you just put the bare motor in the lift. And then that way you don't lose anything because you don't have that stock base on there. Mm -hmm. You don't come all the way up and put the motor through the table. Yeah, there are a few manufacturers who have bases that are just as efficient as your lift and they will bring that collet right up to the surface, making it real easy. Where you can crank it to exactly where you want it to go. Wasn't, wasn't a big deal for handheld. Um, the notch you have, where you have that area relieved, that was underneath, the one yep. you raised, you were going to drop a, what do you call the right thing? The rec oh, the insert plate? You can drop the insert plate in from the top anyway, so my comment is, the only real thickness that's impeding the extension of the collet and the subsequent bit is the plate, correct? Yeah, and so normally... Put it in a two-inch stop and fill a 316 plate. Yeah, normally it's not a problem. Um, for instance, if you go to an aluminum plate, they'll be thinner, or a steel plate. Um, acrylic will be thicker because it's more flexible and you need to prevent it from sagging, so you use thicker material. But it's generally not a problem. If you're using a big straight bit, you've probably got more bit than you need. Uh, you can get longer bits. Uh, you can pay attention and buy bits that have fairly long shanks. They come with all <coughs> different lengths. This is a fairly long shank on this bit. Um, this one has a shorter shank. Big difference in those two. It's a smaller bit, but still, the shank is a whole lot smaller. Yeah? If you're using the uh, router and you want to see and go on your pattern and using it on top of your Mm -hmm. Like that, that plate that you use, what's the maximum you can use for an acrylic plate? For handheld use? Yeah, for handheld use to draw. As big plate. as you like, as long as it's not in your way. This is an acrylic plate for the two, two horsepower DeWalt. And this one was specifically made because I had a jig that it would ride in. And I used acrylic because I had it. But the point in this case was the router dropped into the jig and then traveled in the jig on this plate. But I could also use this handheld and then I can see what I'm doing. <coughs> I could make this bigger and they sometimes do for when you're doing edge routing on a counter so that there's no tendency for the router to tip. You can add a, like a handle too. Yeah. Like an outlet. They'll make a long one with a handle and that way it isn't going to tip off the edge of your workpiece. It's going to stay stable because you've got all you of this base. The same gauge, and my question was, how big a piece of that can you use that or make a plate out of before it's going to be too big? Oh, to make an insert plate? Yeah, and I'm well to move and do it with. Well, when you're 
using it on a surface like that, there's no give to worry about. You don't have to worry about it bending, sagging, or Bob. In a table. In a table, it's an issue. I've got that router back when it was an Eagle sold by Black and Decker. The insert is three eighths acrylic. It's eleven inches long and it sags like it's on the gun. If you leave it there, oh, yeah. Yeah. okay. Yeah, they recommend you not leave those in the table. Yeah. When it's yeah, acrylics are soft. This is a phenolic, and it's a little bit small for this router, but I can get it in and out of the opening. It's about 5 sixteenths thick, and it has never sagged. Now, this router has been hanging on this plate since the mid-90s. Probably, well, not mid, late 90s. So it's been hanging there for over 10 years, and it hasn't sagged. The one problem you're going to run into is if you get a plate, try to pick one that you really, really like because every single one is a different size and shape. So if you decide you want to get another plate so you can swap routers in and out of your table, you're going to have to get the same plate. I've got three different plates. Every one of them is a different size. If I were going to make one, I'd have to decide which one do I want to duplicate. Um, the aluminum one is the one I'll use in the future, and that'll replace this one. But bear in mind, they are all different. So pick one that you're going to like, that you're going to want to live with, and use that size. Yes, Bob? Um, for us bottom feeders, there's another route. You make a plate. Yep. And you scratch master on it. Oh, for making your, the next one? Your, your, your pattern. That's your pattern, and then you use pattern bits to make duplicates. <laughs> exactly. Matter of fact, I didn't bring it, but that's my favorite way of making replacement table saw inserts, yeah. is you take the existing insert, make a couple of runs around it with masking tape because it's a loose fit and you don't want a loose fit. And then you double stick tape that to some MDF, some Baltic birch or whatever, and then you take a pattern bit in your router and zip, you've cut it. And you can even, if you're using a fence in your router table with a straight bit, you can cut a recess because one of the problems that you'll run into when you're making inserts on your own, when you go to drop it in, it butts on the table saw blade and you can't get it into the recess. Which means you have to either mount a smaller blade to do the initial cut of the slot, or, like I say, you can take a straight bit, mount it in your router, measure where that blade is going to be, and then just do a stopped plunge cut. And then you'll be all set. Um, As you can see, I have an assortment of bits. I didn't bring them all, but a piece of 2x4 and a 13 millimeter brad point bit lets you make as many router bit holders as you would like. You can buy fancy cabinets if you like with tilt out shelves and all kinds of goodies, but it's pretty simple to whip up something and like I say don't try to drill the holes with half inch bit and then get half inch shanks in and out because it'll be too tight and when the humidity's up it won't come out and when it gets dry then they'll flop around but 13 millimeter bit gives you enough clearance to where they slide in and out very nicely. Okay, um, if there's nothing else you take away from today I want you to remember something that I learned from Mark Barr, who gave this class, I don't know, six months ago, but I got it from him when Stone Mountain Power Tools was down here on Jimmy Carter back in the mid-90s, and he gave a presentation. Routers go left. Keep this in mind. A router will always try to turn left when you're handheld routing. The reason is, is because when you're looking down on the router, that bit is turning clockwise. So if the bit is turning clockwise and you are cutting into a workpiece this way, what happens as this bit comes in, it actually digs 
into the workpiece. The reason you like that is because you're using some sort of a guide or a guide bearing or whatever, and it keeps it snug up against the guide. So that means if you're going to cut, let's say you're cutting an opening. Didn't you diagram backwards there for what you're saying? The no. No. Backwards. Here's your tip coming around like this. Mm -hmm. And as it's cutting, because you're advancing in this direction, that router bit is trying to carve out wood. That creates a, f a force in this direction, yeah. which holds it in tight. Now we'll talk about the other direction next. But So knowing that this router is always going to want to try to turn left as you advance it, if you're coming around the inside of a piece, you always want to go counterclockwise. If you're routing around the outside of a piece, you're going to go, or excuse me, that was clockwise, this is counterclockwise because the router is trying to turn left. This is also works in your favor when you flip it all upside down and you work it on a router table. You've got a bit and you've got a fence. Well, since we've turned the router over, it's now turning in the opposite direction, but it works the same way. Here's your workpiece. And as you're feeding it, well, let me get the cut on the right side of that bit. Okay, as the router is turning and it's cutting wood, it's actually sucking your workpiece into the fence. So you're advancing the workpiece in this direction. Now there's another type of cut that you can make. It's called a climb cut. In which case, let's say we're looking down on the router, and in fact the router is still turning clockwise. Suppose we tried coming this way on a workpiece where the router is traveling up. Because the cutter is chopping as it cuts, you get a cleaner cut. Ostensibly that sounds like a good thing. However, it's also trying to push the router out of the cut. And once it starts to push the router out of the cut, that bit will try to walk down the piece of wood. So if you're not careful and you're taking too deep a cut, that router will tend to try to take off. It's not a big problem when you're going in the other direction because all you have to do is ease off and the router spins harmlessly in the area it's already cut. In this case, when you're doing a climb cut, it can take off. By the same token, when you're using a router table, you don't ever come in the other direction for the same reason because you will now have a highly unguided rocket in your shop. If you try to advance a piece from the left on a router table, it will grab that piece and throw it. Okay? So, remember, routers turn left. There's a correct direction to feed. You can, if you're doing a finishing cut, if you've already done your basic cut and now you're coming back and you're just trying to clean it up, you can do a climb cut, taking off very little wood and the inertia of the router handheld will work all right. And <clears throat> if the router takes off, it's going to move out of the cut, so it's not going to hurt your workpiece. You've got two hands on the router. It's going to be safe out here, if less than convenient. Not so on a router table. <coughs> Talk about wood grain. Talk about wood grain. But how do you approach the wood? The problem with using a router is it only spins in one direction, so you can't reverse your direction like a chisel or a plane. Uh, sometimes you can flip the wood, and that will help. But ideally, 
gee, it'd be nice if you're always working with grain like this and you're cleanly cutting it. If the grain runs the other way, it's going to tend to splinter it. And about the only thing you can do is take a shallower cut because you can't always reverse the piece, particularly if you're using contour bits or something like that. So, not a whole lot you can do about grain. Uh, one of the pieces that I was doing was some flute racks for a friend and I needed to cut a shape like this and I said, oh well I'll just take a router and do a round over on these edges. Light cuts because I'm going to hit the grain from every possible direction doing that. Same thing if you were to go around a circle. If you have a really bad grain situation, is it preferable to use a, a fine cut on the, on the Vulcan? Only if you take a real shallow cut. And again, I would do not recommend doing that on a router table. The reason being, you don't have anything to limit its travel and once it takes off, I mean, when I'm working at the router table, but you can use the a router pen and you can, you can use a pen so that the object is, you know, your wood is actually laying against the pen and that gives you more control over the work piece and then it's a little bit safer to do a climb cut. A little bit or if you have a holding jig that will hold the piece so that you can get a good grip on it and control it. Now normally in my shop I'm sitting, standing here at the router table and on the jointer to my right are these two push blocks so that I have them easily accessible. Um, <coughs> some of you are aware of how I got this bandage and it was on the router table and as Forrest says, stupid is as stupid does. So if you know better and you ignore some of the things you shouldn't do, this is the bit that did it. <laughs> and it was in this three horsepower router and what I was doing, foolishly, uh, was a plunge cut. Which isn't a, that big a problem. I was basically plunging into the middle of a piece and then finishing it out. Not too big a deal because as soon as you've made the plunge, you're now spinning in the cut and the cut becomes just like any other cut. Two things I didn't do. One is I didn't reach over and grab my push blocks. Second thing is I did the initial plunge and I said, oops, that's a little further off than where I wanted it. And instead of coming back out and plunging again, which is controllable because I can anchor it here with my right hand where it's safe, even if it wants to take off, it just goes like that. Instead of doing that, I says, oh, I'll just ease it in a little. <laughs> And I eased it in just a little, and it grabbed, and it began climb cutting. Well, I wasn't really pushing hard with this hand, but there was enough pressure and enough friction to where when this took off at 100 feet per second, which is how fast that bit is going, the hand went right through. So if, if you're into gore, I have a picture of what it looked like at the emergency room. <laughs> Um, there is a solution for that now, but it's pretty expensive. Uh, so one of the companies that we're associated with here now, they make a router lift that uses a motor and it has a sewing machine pedal. And from, I wouldn't buy one myself, but uh, if this is a thing, something you're going to do, you put the piece on the table, flat against the fence, you put your foot on the table on the pedal, it raises the bit up so you're not like this and you have more control because you've got that piece up against the fence, it's coming straight up through. And it does work better. That's a little safer, but it's a very expensive piece. Well, generally when you're working against the cut of the bit, right. you're safe. The problem occurs when you allow this hand to relax its well, pressure the, the and ease backward. Too. You might think that he's using a big bit, and I'm sure that that was a pretty nasty cut. But I've had the same problem with an eighth inch bit. And a little tiny little eighth inch bit, you'll get away from it. It's amazing. These, you know, we think that, well, I don't want big guys. 
you know, the table saws we are afraid of, but that little bit, you know, router table will do the same thing if you've got his finger. Probably so, that sort of thing happens before you realize Before you can think. 100 feet per second. It's a fraction. So 12 inches was a, ten, a hundredth of a second. Mm -hmm. It's that quick. It's real close to the speed of the tip on a table saw. I want to mention this has what's called a router razor and this allows me to adjust the bit penetration from above the table. At the time I bought this nobody had this built into their routers. A lot of the newer routers come with a base with this built in. Really, really convenient. But if you go hunting on the web on the internet, you can find old episodes of the Router Workshop, which was a Canadian show that was broadcast on PBS, and you'll watch these two guys, father and son team, Bob and Rick, making anything you can imagine with a router, super simple setup, super simple tables, super simple fences, nothing fancy, and these two guys knew what they were doing. It's an excellent. You used to be able to view the episodes for free on their website, but now they're trying to sell them. So you have to hunt around, but there are some locations where you can find the Woodworking Channel and a couple of other locations where you can actually view the old episodes. You can go to their website, the woodworkingshop.com, and they have lots of little clips hints and kicks, how to make and use jigs, how to do this safely, how to do that. One of the best shows I've ever seen on routers. One final is on jigs. I mentioned that these bushings are real handy. This is a shelf pin drilling jig. What I did is I took and used the spacing that was already built into a piece of uh, pegboard and my drill press and I drilled half inch holes where the original holes were. Then I take a half inch router bushing, put it in my router so that it just drops into these holes. Being a plunge router, I then plunge the router, it drills a hole drills a cleaner hole than a twist bit will make, and then you just move to the next. You clamp this a little further down and you can drill more. Um, super simple, it's easy, it's precise, they don't wander, you don't have a bunch of tear out. All you need is one of these bushings and a quarter inch straight bit or a five millimeter if perhaps you're using off-size uh, shelf pegs. But it's a great system, simple to do. Another thing you can do is you can make yourself a trammel. A trammel is for drilling hole, uh, circles, cutting circles. What I did is I took a piece of masonite scrap and I drilled three holes where the mounting screws for my router go, chamfered them, mounted the router, took a half inch bit, drilled right through this. So now I have a piece of wood with a half inch bit sticking out. Then I decide, decided where I wanted the radius. Now the radius can be out here for a large circle and what's going to happen is I'm going to use an aluminum roofing nail which happens to be eighth inch. Stick that down into a piece and the router will pivot around it. This, if you've got a 60 inch tabletop that you need to put a contoured edge on, this is one way to do it. It'll round that table. Suppose you only need to do oh, a five inch circle. A little less convenient, you gotta put your pin in before you mount your router but it will pivot around that pin and you can do small circles as well. Don't have to go out and spend a lot of money to do it. You need a different dimension, drill another hole wherever you want it. It doesn't care. It doesn't have to be down a straight line or anything like that. So that's a convenient, easy way to use it. If in fact you need to do this uh, on a piece that you can't afford to have a locating pin hole. What you do is you take a block 
of wood and you double stick tape it to the workpiece and your pin comes through here. And then you have an extension arm, spacer, and the end piece that holds the router. The router will be up here. So now you've double stick taped this to the center piece and it will pivot just like this does on a pin. You can do a whole lot of this uh, inexpensively. One of the problems that you run into is if you want to route a narrow end on a rail, it has a tendency to want to do this, so you need some way to keep it steady. They have some really fancy, slick, ultra-high molecular weight plastic sleds you can buy. Or you can just grab a hunk of wood, stick a handle on it however you want. This one's just a little fancier than it needs to be, but it's nothing more than a dowel stuck in a hole with something stuck over it. And this becomes not only a backup block, which allows me to minimize cut out, tear out, but it's a safety measure. I just push that through on the router table up against the fence. Real simple, inexpensive. Um, I know we're past time. If anybody would like to see them, these are test blocks where I took those router edge form, table edge forming bits, and I use them at different depths. You don't have to always use the whole bit. And if you only use portions of the bit, as in how far do you extend it, you get different contours. So these were samples that I made just to see what I could do with these bits that I picked up here. you adjust your depth with the... I use the router razor. If you didn't have a router razor, uh, then you would have whatever adjustment is built into your router. You might have a plunge router and you'd plunge it and lock it. Yeah. And he and Vickery uh, visited my shop and he saw my router table and he asked me how I adjusted the height of my bit. And I simply loosened it. I remember that. <laughs> he, he turned green. <laughs> he said, that thing goes through you before you even knew it was loose. Uh -huh. And he, he, he corrected me on that. Yep. But if you have the router on a plate, you simply lift the plate and the router up out of the table if it doesn't have a razor device, and you readjust the body of the router. Whether it's a fixed base or a plunge base, you simply adjust the extension. Uh, there's a, another trick is to actually move your fence. Uh, the, the fence he's got that's got the pivot on it, you can sneak up on the cut. Mm -hmm. So you can expose less of the cutting surface on your first pass, and then move your fence back a little bit. Your second pass, which will take more material, mm -hmm. and end up on your bearing surface. So especially if you've got uh, a smaller router, you know, like, like a one and a half horse, it allows you to make, um, you know, the same kind of cuts that you could on a larger router uh, by sneaking up on it like that. So what we've covered is a little bit about the routers that are out there, uh, methods of adjusting the height of the router cut whether you're handheld or in a table. Uh, the guide methods, whether it's a router man mounted fence or a table fence or a guide bearing that isn't mounted to the bit. Uh, you've got a lot of options out there. You can spend a fortune on bits and accessories or you can fashion a lot of them yourself, and they will work every bit as good as the commercial ones. What's the other jig over there, Bob? Which other jig? The wall, the oh. Over on the wall. Yeah, well, way back, oh. Well, I won't even get into that. Way back when I decided I would build this super slick, fancy uh, dado jig for doing things like making dados for shelves in cabinets. And it's adjustable. 
It's adjustable in width. It's adjustable in length. Now the width is adjusted to suit the router that you're using. And essentially what you're going to do is you're going to set this space so that the router travels through here. And if there's any wobble room, it's because you wanted a wider cut than the bit you're using. For instance, I could make a three-quarter cut with a half-inch bit by simply leaving an extra amount of clearance. Go one way up, one, come over, come back, and you're done. Sounds good in theory. It's more trouble than it's worth. Um, I made it. I did use it. I have never used it since. The method that I have learned to use is with this mortising bit that's mounted in this router. Uh, clear some space here. What we do, let's say I've got a board and I want to plow a dado in this board to mount a shelf. What I do is I take another piece of board, same width, and I lay it on top. Could be a longer board, and I clamp that in place. Then I take a little piece of the material that the shelf is going to be made of, and I butt that up against here. Now I take a third piece of wood like this, butt that up against the shelf segment, clamp that in place. When I remove that little se shelf segment, there's a groove. Well, this bearing bit, remember, has a bearing, and below that, it has a cutter. So I can run this bearing through that groove between these two pieces and cut. If I need to cut deeper, the cut I've already made provides the surface for the bearing. So I just extend the bearing a little, the bit a little bit further, and I can plow this dado to whatever depth I want. It is going to fit precisely. And because actually I normally use a piece of shelf or a spare shelf to do this, it lines up, give me a perfect 90, and everything lines up neatly. It is just so much simpler than messing with that complicated jig. And it's precise. Matter of fact, it can be too precise. You may need a little helper to knock those shelves into place when you do that. Do that over using a dado set in a dado If you are building a entertainment center with six foot high sides and you want to put dados in for shelves, that's more than you want to try and maneuver on your table saw. So now you're looking at handheld routing because the piece is just too big to get up on a table and safely manage. That's the primary reason you're going to do handheld routing because tables are so convenient. But when the piece is just too big or you can't get it to your shop, you're left with the router in your hands. It's called a radial arm. Sorry. Yeah, radial arm. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but well, that'll work. No question about it. Just don't take too big a cut because that dado set will come after you. <laughs> I'll bet. Um, the problem usually on that sort of thing is not so much making a cut, it's the set. I mean, the ability on the Well, since I brought them and nobody has left yet, I'll talk about these two jigs. Remember I was talking about these porta cable guide bushings? What I did is I took a piece of wood, ran a stopped half inch cut in that piece of wood for this bearing to ride in. What happens is, let me get this bit out of the way. Let's pretend this is in the router table and it won't tip over. This piece will go in whatever direction you like, guided by that guide bushing. The 
cut will always be 90 degrees to this fence because that's the way the groove is. So what I've done is I've made a box joint jig that will actually, I'll use a quarter inch bit in there, and I use a piece here to prevent tear out. Now normally on a table saw you'll have a sacrificial fence to prevent tear out because the bit's tearing through the workpiece. Well with a router bit, because it's spinning, it wants to cause tear out on one edge going in one direction and on the other edge going in the other direction. So I have a plate that I will put in front of the workpiece, clamp it down snugly, and it will protect and prevent tear out on both sides because I have the back fence and the front fence. And if you've never used a box joint jig, you simply make a cut, step it over one onto the little peg, make another cut, and keep going for whatever width of the piece you're cutting. And I, it's not a one-on-one -on -one topic, but I just, for the first time, used I've got the Incra for the big setup with the router table. Mm -hmm. Cut the first dovetail we've ever done with that thing, and it is amazing. I have two dovetail jigs, and I've never used either. You stack, just like that, you stack the boards and cut them all at the same time. You don't have any tear out. And throw yeah, them. well, normally if I'm doing pieces, I'll stack a couple. Yeah. Um, the downside to this jig, being so small and comfortable and convenient, is that it can pop up off of that guide bearing, and you get this type of thing, where you have tracks of the cutter running across the bottom of it. So bigger and heavier might be an advantage in that case. But again, simple way to do it. Yeah, you could cut box joints on your table saw. Uh, I have a jig for that. But this seemed like a slick thing and Mark Barr was showing it one day, so I said, I gotta go make one of those, so I did. I've actually used these a few times. I didn't mention this before. This is my hold down, which works in concert with this fence. It actually has a piece of masonite on the back to shim it out away from the fence so that the fingers can move freely. And I can easily clamp this with two clamps. And that way, whatever I'm passing through here, instead of riding up on top of the bit, which they have a tendency to want to do, it'll keep it down snug to the table without my hands being anywhere near the bit. So sometimes I do it right. <laughs> so Bob, did you uh, cut that on uh, the bandsaw? Or? Yeah, yeah the, the fingers were cut on the bandsaw. It's just a few pieces of wood glued together, some poplar, could have been anything. You can make them whatever size and shape suits your fence. Or you can spend a bunch of money and buy the plastic feather boards. I have... Or you scrap acrylic. Yeah, they make, it's nice and flexible. If you have scrap acrylic, yes. Now, a lot of the fences in the marketplace have T-slots either tacked in or molded in if it's an aluminum fence. The aluminum fence probably works just fine for clamping feather boards. I'm a little leery of using a screwed in T-track to do that because any real pressure on it is liable to lift the T-track out of the fence. It's okay if it's only side to side pressure, but if there's any pressure that pulls it away, I don't trust those hold down screws. So, questions? Can you use a um, shaper for most of the part you would use for a router table? Except it's hard to pick up and carry with you. Well, how do you use a handheld too? <laughs> That's what well, I mean. I'm just saying, if you've got a, a router table at your shop. A shaper will do everything a router will do, and it will do it uh, smoother, faster, uh, more conveniently. It's just a question of how many people are willing to invest in a shaper and shaper cutters. Hmm. Tooling is... Cutters, but they but they do make spindles. They make a router that spindle that you can put in a shaper. That's true. And they if do. If you ever buy one of those things, make a nice shatter box and put it on the wall because they're not worth a damn. <laughs> a, a shaper. Well, the old Delta heavy duties. I don't know where they are now, but they used to run at ten grand. 
These are running around 20 grand. Yeah, of course, they're swinging a three, four inch bit, exactly. too. Exactly. Yeah, so it's. Not if, not if you've got a spindle adapter in it. Now you're running your router bits at half the speed they need to be most of the time. That's true. Um, you will occasionally see recommendations to run a router bit in a drill press to, d to make some cuts. And the drill press does not go fast enough. And it is not designed for side loads, so I would again recommend you avoid doing that. Ron? Um, we talked about this earlier when we were talking about direction travel. We, we've established that there's a, uh, if the router's mounted in a table, you're using a fence, you feed the stock from right to left. If I'm using the, the router as a portable pole, I'm going left to right. I can't do it that way. Counterclockwise. Depends upon whether you're on the inside or the outside of the piece. Well, I'm always facing the piece if I'm using a portal. Are you on the outside of the piece or the outside of the hole? Though. If I'm on the outside of the piece. But my question is the piece is a rectangular cutting board. And it's not an end grain cutting board, it's a long grain cutting board. What are you going to do first, the long grain or the end grain? End grain. The same as you would with the hand plane. No, the hand plane. Yeah, you would prefer to do your end grain first so that you clean up your tear out when you make the side grain cut. The, the answer is as long as you have a, a sacrificial block on the edge of so your end grain, doesn't feel it doesn't matter. Just, just make sure you always have a block on the end so that when you cut against it, you're, you're going into another solid surface and it prevents tear out. Remember, routers turn left. So when you're advancing that router, you always want your workpiece on the left side of that cut when you're working handheld. So on the inside, you go clockwise. On the outside, you go counterclockwise. Routers turn left. Exactly, I did. My 690s have got an arrow like stuck right on top so that I know Left oh, the right. direction? <laughs> yeah. Because it's easy to forget. Yeah, actually, I debated long and hard over whether to get a standalone three horsepower plunge router or whether I would get the old 690 dual base kit that was available at the time. And I, I bit for the three horsepower. And there have been times I thought, boy, I really wish I had that 690 dual base because it's a handy, handy router. The best router. thing about the 690, because it spins inside the base, your, your collet is always dead center. So it doesn't matter what direction you hit the workpiece, it's always dead center to that base. Whereas these that are the, the ratcheting type, they tend to, depending on which side of the base you're on, you can have some variation in the distance from the center. Well. The bases can vary, and a lot of times the phenolic base that's screwed on protrudes beyond the aluminum casting. Is it really going to center your bit? Is it equidistant from the bit to the outside all the time? Don't know. It depends. You, you may get lucky, and it may be, or maybe not. You may have rough aluminum castings like this, where the base is actually slightly smaller than the aluminum, so you're riding on the aluminum on any fence. Uh, it has two flat surfaces. Are they equidistant from the center of that bit? Don't know. Don't think I would trust it. There's lots of guides you can use, but when all is said and done, measure, make test cuts, try it again. Don't take your best piece and make your first cut on it. Make a cut on scrap, confirm that it's really going to cut where you want it to cut, and then go ahead. Hey Bob, have you had any problems with the switches on this, on the door? No. No, um, the only problem I've had with any of these is that the bearing went on the black and, or the craftsman from being mounted in a table. It didn't like being upside down eating sawdust. So I had to replace the bearing. The problem I have with the one that's in the table now is that my dust collection has a box under the router to keep from a 
all the sawdust collected. It establishes a swirl pattern inside that box from the airflow, and that swirl pattern tends to pack sawdust into all the cooling slots of the router and into the switch itself. But I use an external switch. It's just an ordinary wall switch mounted in a box, and I plug the router into the extension cord coming out of that switch, and I just flip the switch. Um, which, by the way, I didn't bring it because it's a pain in the neck to dismount it. But if you have a standard household toggle switch mounted in a box, if you will take a large fender washer, bend it to a 90 degree, and then either glue it or screw it, you can put a shield around that switch so that you won't ever inadvertently bump into it and change its position. That way you have to reach your finger in under that fender washer to get to this switch and turn it on or off. It doesn't cost a whole lot. It's easy to do. You can get for $30, $40 a power switch for your router that they will sell you. Or you can go buy a 50 cent switch and a dollar box and an extension cord and you're in business. That's true, you won't. You can actually buy those for 20 bucks from Grizzly. Oh, the switch, yeah. Yeah, the big ugly one. Where actually, they have it for about $5. It used to be 10 They used to take the load, though. Yeah, these don't pull that much. Anything that you're going to plug into household 115 has to be 15 amps or less. You're not going to get any commercial power tools that pull more than 15 amps, and a household light switch is designed to handle 15 amps. You can buy 20 amp switches too, but an ordinary light switch is 15 amp switch. And they're available for less than a buck. <laughs> I got one other comment. Um, you can buy a, uh, a variable speed device, either as a paddle or as a knob, that will let you attenuate the amount of power that goes to a router and it changes speed. So if you have one of those, you can use it with a router that does not have variable speed, and it's pretty handy. The only problem with it is if your router is a soft start, soft start router, it doesn't work with it. No. So it's got to be like your, just your regular standard, you know, cheap router, essentially. I don't think you ever get soft start in a single speed router, though. Mm -hmm. I haven't, you uh, seen them? Yeah. Uh, uh, it's not a touch. It's, another, it's one of the German manufacturers. Really? Okay, because they're usually variable speed if they have soft start. Any more questions? You're welcome. Thanks for coming.